Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good morning. Uh, first of all, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Dennis Gannon, and I'm the Director of Applications for Cloud Computing Futures Group. This is an interesting uh, experience for me because I'm introducing a speaker where I think many of you probably know him more than you know me. Uh, but uh, still, it's, it's a great honor to do so, uh, Samir Agarwal uh, from the University of Washington. Uh, he is a uh, currently a postdoc there in the Vision Laboratory. And here comes a bunch more of his friends. As I said, he knows many of you. Um, and uh, uh, prior to his work uh, as a postdoc, he was did his PhD at the University of California, uh, San Diego. Uh, so Samir, I'll let you take it away. Thanks, Dennis. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a project that I've been working on uh, for a couple of months now with uh, Rick, uh, my advisor Steve, and Noah Snavely, uh, and Ian Simon, and Yasutaka Furukawa. And I'm going to, uh, this is a fairly high level talk, but I'm happy to answer uh, any questions that you have, so feel free to stop me and uh, we can uh, drill down if you like. So. At least some of you might have heard that there is this thing called the internet, and it's sort of changing the way we're looking at doing things. And the thing that I'd like to point, a, point your attention to is that if you go to Flickr and you type in the word Rome, these are sort of the images that come up. And what is remarkable about uh, these images is that they, they capture Rome from every possible uh, viewpoint, time of day, kind of camera, uh, photographic talent. Uh, and the same structure, for example, the Colosseum is imaged from the inside, from the outside. And they're, they're, it's really an evolving photographic record of the city. Uh, it's, it's dynamic. It's growing with every passing day. Uh, and it's very different. Uh, I would argue it's, it's more organic and much more interesting than sort of almost sterile uh, captures that you will see in Google Street View or Virtual Earth. They're, there's a van driving down the street which is capturing it at a uniform sampling rate. Uh, here, we almost, uh, not only do we have uh, a photographic record of the city, we, we are also capturing its evolution. Uh, we, are, we are capturing activities. Uh, and we are also capturing uh, what can vaguely be defined as sort of what is interesting about the city. Uh, by, by the very uh, statistics of these photographs, we sort of know where the attention of people uh, is drawn to. And what is perhaps even uh, what's, an, what's another interesting thing about this is at the rate at which uh, these things are growing. So these are 52 months worth of growth numbers for Flickr since it started. Uh, this is still about May of last year. And today it has, I think, uh, more than 4 billion photographs. Uh, the numbers for uh, more uh, private photo collections like uh, Picasa Web or uh, Microsoft Live uh, photo sharing uh, are even more staggering. And uh, if you go to things like Facebook, the, the numbers there are in between 15 and 20 billion photographs. So the, so the internet is not just, uh, or, or these photo collections are not just a way of communicating. Uh, for computer vision researchers uh, like me, they're almost a way of sensing the world around us. We, we have this now. Ten years ago, when people wrote computer vision papers, uh, they would. Uh, one of the concerns would be, how am I acquiring the data? Uh, can I, how, how much, uh, how much do I pay someone, or how much time do I spend taking camera around and capturing some data, and then can I run uh, my algorithms on it? Today, we have this enormous data store, which is available to us uh, for us to tap on and 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 to experiment with. And a very interesting and important. Uh, step was taken in this direction uh, by Noah Snavely, which was, again, work with Rick and Steve at University of Washington a couple of years ago, where uh, he, the, the project initially was known as Photo Tourism, and where he started by downloading pictures of a single site uh, from the internet, in this case, the Trevi Fountain, uh, and reconstructing it, uh, you're reconstructing the 3D structure of it, uh, matching all the images to each other, and then building this, uh, this uh, 
photo browsing experience around it using the 3D structure, which allows you to place these photographs uh, in the 3D scene and the positions of the, uh, of the people who took them and to annotate the 3D scene uh, to share uh, information across photographers and so on. And the idea was uh, so beautiful and successful that Microsoft uh, went ahead and uh, built a product around it, uh, which I'm sure all of you know as Microsoft Photosynth. The, the, the thing to note about uh, both photo tourism and Photosynth is that these are essentially uh, single site oriented uh, systems. And, 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 th and there are multiple reasons for it. One is that uh, the, the basic design of the system was aimed towards hundreds to, to, to a couple of thousand photographs. And that's sort of the scale at which uh, photo tourism and uh, photos and work at. And the expectation was that, that, that the usage of the system is from uh, one person's uh, individual view of a particular site. So that's sort of the scale at which they'll be uploading photographs. Our starting point is a little bit different from it. We went back to the web and looked at some statistics. And these are sort of the number of photographs you'll uh, get if you type in the name of a city. And uh, so for example, Venice, and these are old numbers. These are a couple of months, months old. These numbers are growing very rapidly. Uh, Dubrovnik is not listed here, but uh, I checked on that. So when we started the project, uh, Dubrovnik had 60,000 photographs, and now it has about 150,000 photographs on Flickr alone. So these numbers are growing very rapidly. Uh, but what is interesting about them is that they're far, far away from a couple of thousand photographs. And this is the scale that we are interested in. What we are interested in is taking this entire photo collection and putting this uh, into a system which is conceptually like Photosynth or Photo Tourism and building 3D models of the entire city. Okay. So the task that we set ourselves was, and this is mostly an artificial number uh, at, at some level, is download a million images of Rome, uh, match all the images to each other, and build a 3D model of the city. And of course, this statement by itself doesn't mean much if you don't set yourself a computational budget. So the computational budget that we set ourselves was that we will do all of this in 24 hours on 1,000 cores. And in the rest of the talk, I will try and convince you that uh, we are making interesting and substantial progress towards this goal. We haven't quite reached there yet, but I think it's uh, well within our reach. And to just convince you that, uh, that it's worth sitting through the rest of my talk, uh, here's an example of the, uh, the kind of reconstruction that we're talking about. I will let you guess where in the world this is. Yeah, it is San Marco in Venice. And uh, this is a model which, uh, where we started with uh, 250,000 images of Venice. Uh, and after matching, we got a connected component containing about 14,000 images. The model itself contains about 4.4 million points, uh, corresponding to about uh, 26 million observations. So that, of course, begs the question, why do we want to do this? Uh, the first one, which I like telling, telling everyone, is because we can. Uh, I think. It's a fundamentally interesting question uh, to figure out what is sort of the biggest thing you can do. Uh, that, that feeds my ego. Uh, but on a, on a more pragmatic level, I think there are some very interesting applications. Uh, the first one is that, as I mentioned, the, these images uh, that, we, that we're working with, they offer a much richer uh, source of data than uh, data that uh, more structured collections of images that you'll get from sources like uh, Street View or uh, Virtual Earth, which means that uh, you have interiors, uh, you have uh, varying level of geometric details. So you can hope to get geometric reconstructions where you have texture, uh, you have detailed both interior and exterior models, uh, and hopefully we can get uh, solid models uh, and, and texture maps that, that we can build uh, uh, these models out of. Uh, you can imagine that once you have data like this, you can build the next generation GPS systems where instead of uh, flat 2D line uh, illustrations on your uh, GPS screen, you can and, and try to imagine where you are, you can actually see, see where you should be. Uh, another interesting thing, which uh, there were two events which, which made me think about it. Uh, I was back home in India uh, this year. Uh, my girlfriend, it was her first trip back home, and I was showing her around India, and I had a chance to look at some of the uh, historical sites that I had visited in my childhood, but see them again. 
And it occurred to me that, at least at some places, the state of historical preservation is quite poor. And systems like this offer us an opportunity to at least capture uh, these sites today and, as computer scientists, preserve them digitally uh, for, uh, for the time uh, in the future. Uh, and in fact, something like this has already been done in the US. Uh, after 9-11, the US government commissioned laser rain scanning of some of the major monuments in the US. So Mount Rushmore and Statue of Liberty were rain scanned. I'm sure a couple of other ones were done too, but those are the two that I'm aware of. Uh, another thing that you might have heard about, uh, this, was, this was in the news a couple of weeks ago, uh, there's an entire city in China that is going to be raised down. I think it's called Kashgar. It's, it's quite a historical city, but it's not seismically safe. And after uh, the last earthquake in China, they've decided they're going to raise it down and build a new city there, which is good from the point of view of civilization, but I think it's quite sad uh, from, from a historical perspective. And since we actually have a deadline of when that city will cease to exist, uh, it's an interesting question to ask. Uh, can we uh, actually do something about keeping record uh, of that thing alive? Uh, another thing, uh, which, which is a pattern that we've seen in computer science and uh, fields that have started using computers in their study is that the moment you have uh, your structure or data on a computer, you can actually study it. You can do, uh, you can slice it, dice it, you can do experiments with it, uh, you can study the statistics of it, you can compare uh, things across it. So once we have the structure of an entire city inside a computer, you can imagine that uh, the kind of uh, historical, anthropological, sociological, uh, geographical studies that you can do. You can study the evolution of cities. You can try and understand what is common across cities, what is common in the same city. Uh, how, how did cities grow? And finally, uh, this is something that gets suggested to me every single time that I talk about this, which is, you know, I'd like to do Grand Theft Auto Rome, uh, blow stuff up in a real city. And, and in fact, uh, there is a game that's being developed uh, at the University of Washington. Uh, Zoran Popovich and Kathleen Tweet are working on it uh, in collaboration with Noah where uh, they are trying to uh, make structure of motion into a version of capture the flag, which is quite interesting. So uh, at, from a more computer science perspective, uh, there are some, I see a lot of uh, advantages to working on something like this. And with all due respect to people who do computer vision, I love MATLAB. Uh, I live inside MATLAB for uh, most of my time when I'm doing computer vision. But it is also the case that uh, things that we tout as computer vision systems uh, more often than not are MATLAB programs, which, uh, which means that they will never quite work on any, any data of any real size. Uh, they, the, these algorithms, these systems are designed with in-core operation. All your data fits in memory. Uh, you have a single processor, maybe a little bit of multiprocessing, but uh, the, the, the algorithms typically are designed with single core processing in mind. Uh, and I think that scaling, uh, any, any system uh, up uh, uh, over data is actually a fundamental innovation. And, and the reason for that is that I, that I think that once you start running a system with large amounts of data, uh, it, it exposes weaknesses in the system. It tells you what methods truly work, what don't. I think that uh, the difference between n squared and n uh, truly becomes evident when you actually run it on large data. Sometimes your desktop computer is fast enough that for the, uh, for the large data sets that you're running it on, n squared doesn't make, uh, the, the constant is small enough that the, uh, you don't see the difference. But when you actually go to things which are beyond the capacity of a single computer, you start seeing those differences. Uh, the other thing is that once you realize what doesn't work, it creates demand for new methods. Uh, and that's sort of the reason for this project to exist, because we know that uh, comparing all photographs to each other for, for doing this kind of structure for motion uh, stuff doesn't work. Uh, and we expect that uh, every single stage of the work that we are doing, matching, uh, actual geometric estimation, uh, dense model reconstruction, all of them uh, have uh, sort of bottlenecks related to scaling in them. And uh, work in, the, in this direction will make uh, progress in all of them. So it's not just, uh, uh, or sort of, uh, if you were to trivialize it, it is, it is not just a systems project. I believe that uh, we will be making fundamental progress in, in basic computer vision. And uh, just to you know, say that again, uh, parallel uh, algorithms in vision is, is a very, uh, uh, is a mostly unexplored area. Uh, 
yesterday I gave the stock at uh, University of Washington, I said it's an unexplored area and I got into a bit of trouble, so I'm now using the adjective mostly. Uh, but uh, things like data distribution, load balancing, large scale optimization, uh, uh, doing parallel numerical linear algebra, these things are not things that we, that we usually think about, but they have uh, basic and fundamental implications on what we can and cannot do. Uh, so uh, projects like this, uh, I think, uh, will lead us forward in all of these directions. All right, so now that I've explained or taken enough time talking about why we should be doing this, let's get on with the approach. Uh, the, the, the system is uh, five stages that can be summarized like this. We start by scraping images from the web. Uh, this is just simple web scraping. Uh, we extract features, and those of you who know what SIFT is, we use SIFT features here. Uh, most of our time is actually spent in phase three, which is actually matching these images, and I'll, and I'll spend some time talking about it. Uh, then we kind of extract the backbone of our match graph, which we call skeletal sets, uh, and I'll talk about that. And finally, we actually do the geometric reconstruction uh, from these match graphs. And bundle adjustment is sort of just a fancy name that computer vision people like to use for uh, large scale nonlinear optimization. And uh, we'll ha I'll have more to say on that. The, so scraping images and ex extracting features uh, is, is standard stuff, and I won't spend any time on it. The thing that I would like to talk about is actually image matching. So, there are different forms of image matching depending on the kind of application that you have in mind. The kind of image matching that we are interested in is that given a pair of images, we would like to find out if there are points common in those images uh, which correspond to the same uh, point in the 3D world. And this is uh, a fairly compute intensive uh, task because it involves potentially comparing all pairs of points to all other. We don't do that, we use an approximate nearest neighbor scheme. But even with a fairly optimized implementation, if I were to take a million images uh, and compare all pairs of images to each other, that's half a trillion comparisons. And at 10,000 comparisons a second, which is a good estimate of what, what we might be able to do uh, on 1,000 cores, uh, I'm still talking about a year and a half spent doing this. And what is sad about it is that if you go back and look at the images of Rome, uh, it's sort of almost completely wasted effort. Uh, if you try matching a random pair of images here, there's nothing in common between them. So even though this is a very large source of data, the overwhelming number of images won't match to each other. And that's just the nature of, this, uh, of these kind of data sets. Uh, this is sort of the trade-off that you make from going from structured sources to unstructured sources. You don't have control over the images people are taking. Somebody might just stand at one place and just keep his finger on the trigger and take 10 images and upload them to Flickr with the tag Rome, and we'll get all of them in our collection. And somebody, uh, somebody else might just take uh, some random images uh, which are inside a room and still tag it as room, and they will not match uh, uh, anything of interest. So it, it, it makes sense to, to be a little bit more intelligent in, uh, in, the, in the way we, we spend our compute effort. And one way uh, to sort of motivate uh, what we do is to go back, uh, is to see, uh, is to characterize if you, were, if you could actually match all these images to each other, what does a match graph look like? So we did that experiment, uh, and this is uh, sort of the true match graph for about 20,000 images uh, or so. And there are a couple of things, well, there are two basic things to note about this, this graph. The, the red dots here are images, and there are blue edges between them if there are uh, 3D points sort of visible. The same 3D point is visible in, in those pairs of images. And there is a threshold on you have to see at least 10, 20 points before we consider a match to be significant. So the two things to notice here is that A, that it's very sparse, uh, and which is sort of evident from the, uh, the photo collection that I showed you earlier, that there's, there are, there's very little matches across these images. B, it is very clumpy. And this has to do with the fact that uh, in a city, there are only a few places that attract the vast majority of people to photograph. And even at, at those places, uh, there are a few viewpoints which are way more popular than others. Even if there is plenty of space in front of a monument, there are like five or 10 locations where people will go and take photographs, which results in these really clumpy graphs. And, uh, so, and, and this is something that we should be able to exploit. Uh, because imagine if you're able to sort of land inside one of these clumps, since these clumps are so densely connected, 
doing a couple of steps of walking in these clumps, you should be able to get the connections to uh, inside it. And that will serve as sort of the basic design, uh, design principle uh, behind our match, match algorithm. So, the, so what we do for our uh, matching algorithm is that we structure it as a uh, series of, uh, uh, as multiple phases of matching. And in each phase, we have two steps. We first come up with a list or, of pairs of images that we think will match. And then we actually spend the compute effort to find detailed matches between them. Because that's sort of our precious uh, time spent, uh, actually comparing two, matches in de uh, two images in detail. And we use two, kinds of way, uh, two, two methods for actually proposing when we think two images uh, uh, may be matching. The first kind uh, is a whole image similarity, uh, where uh, we, it's a very text, text retrieval inspired approach where we take an image and we uh, sort of distill it down to a high dimensional vector. So it's not just the pixels of the uh, image, we actually detect features. And those of you, uh, the citation which is cut down here, but uh, those of you who are familiar with literature on recognition, uh, David Nister and Henrik Stevenius did some very nice work on using vocabulary trees for matching images. So that's the representation that we use here. And then comparing these, uh, these vector representations, just like uh, TF-IDF vectors for text uh, retrieval approaches, uh, the closer these vectors are, the, the, the more similar these images, is, uh, images are. And uh, that's sort of illustrated on the left. The second kind of proposal that we use uh, is basically a, a, a analog of the uh, walking in the clump that I was talking about. It's called query, uh, search people know it as query expansion, graph people call it transitive closure. And the idea is that if images i and j, we know, uh, we've actually verified that they match each other, and j and k, uh, we know have uh, points common between them, then there's a good chance that images i and k are probably looking at the same object. It's not necessary, but there's a good chance. And so we'll go ahead and propose that images i and k uh, be subject to detailed matching. Yeah. Is this a different sense of query expansion than um, system and fill than those guys where they generate new query features? They basically look at features in an image? So. Uh, in terms of the graph, it is not because uh, they're, they're also just walking the graph. Uh, but in its most general sense, uh, what query expansion is, is that you start with a query, and then you use the results of the initial query to make the, uh, the query richer. Because when people initially throw out a query, uh, they, are, uh, they want to specify the minimal amount of information. So you're trying to augment the query by the, the statistical information associated with that query. But the underlying graph theoretic thing that is happening is this transitive closure. So in our case, uh, there is no interest region that we are identifying. We, and we are interested in not just in one query, we are interested in all queries. So we sort of abstract that away and just ask the question, what, what kind of transitive uh, uh, walking on the graph that we can do? So this is sort of the way the, the algorithm progresses. Uh, so we do two rounds of matching based on proposals from whole image similarity and four rounds based on transitive closure. And as you can see that the transitive closure for these kind of uh, image collections is very, very effective. And very quickly, the, the graph gains an enormous amount of uh, density in terms of uh, pairwise matching of images. Uh, and clearly, the, the initial proposal uh, is uh, based on whole image similarities are good enough for us to be able to actually do the transitive closure. Because the thing to remember is that the transitive closure will only uh, work within a connected component. If the initial proposals uh, don't give you enough of a connected component, then uh, the transitive closure will, will do nothing. And these are sort of the numbers that we get uh, when we actually run this system. So we experimented with uh, data sets from three different cities. Uh, Dubrovnik, which is in, in, in Croatia on the coast. It had about 58,000 images. Rome, we isolated it, just randomly sampled uh, the first 150,000 images that we could get. And Venice, uh, 250,000 images. And uh, the Dubrovnik experiments were run in about 350 cores. They were actually run here at Microsoft uh, on the shared uh, infrastructure, which are uh, dual quad core uh, Xeon nodes. And Rome and Venice were run on 500 cores. And they take about five, nine, and 27 hours to just do the matching. So, but that begs the question, how good are these results in terms of accuracy? I've just shown you sort of numbers saying these are the number of things we tried, and these are the number of matches uh, that, that we got. Uh, before I get to that, it is worth mentioning that in each of these cases, 
the amount of compute effort that we spent was less than 0.1% of the total number of pairwise comparisons uh, that you would do uh, naively. So we went back and did a ground truth experiment where we went back to the 20,000 uh, images of Rome uh, that we had uh, compared to, uh, that we had the exhaustive pairwise comparison data for. And in our experiments, we found that our system for about, le uh, for about a quarter of a percent of matching effort got more than 90% uh, of the true matches. Yes? So the number of feature points uh, varies. Uh, we are we're not controlling it. We just tell Ceph to find uh, in its default configuration how many it wants to find. So they can vary from uh, a thousand to for some texture-rich images, you can actually go up to ten or twelve thousand features. Is matches here pair, image pairs or feature pairs? Uh, image pairs. Image. image pairs. You had a question? Yes. Is, is there a reason not to look at some of the vector quantization for, for doing the search? So that it's we are. So the whole image similarity, uh, the, what I meant by vocabulary tree, is a vector quantization approach. It's a tree structured vector quantization approach that is used for quantizing the features that you detect in each image. And uh, that vector quantization uh, serves as a representation of the whole image. And that's what we compared for our first stage proposals. <clears throat> So any characteristics for the 10% that we're not found on the small islands? So that's, that, that, that's a good question. Uh, so there are thin links that we miss because uh, there isn't, uh, since, since we are depending on this clumpiness behavior, we will obviously miss thin links here. But uh, we don't quite have a characterization right now as in what kind of images we are missing. One thing I should mention is that the vocabulary tree that we used here is just a single vocabulary tree that we uh, trained on one data set very early on in our, in our experiments. Uh, one could imagine that uh, you could train one on the fly for the particular city uh, that you're dealing with data set and capture a little bit more. So by so it's a question of what do you mean by ground truth? That's why ground truth is in code. So we have a basic subroutine which will t uh, detect features, uh, match them using approximate nearest neighbors, and then verify those matches uh, using uh, ransack. So, and, and we run that routine on all pairs of images. That's our ground truth. Now, it could very well be that our, the feature detector that we use is not good enough, or the ANN method that we're using uh, is not doing its job, uh, or our, uh, Ransack implementation, uh, the, the, we didn't run, for example, enough number of iterations for some reason. For, so the ground truth is a function of, the, of what we consider to be uh, the best effort that we can make to match two images. You may be able to come up with a better subroutine for matching images. In that case, the ground truth will change. But, uh, so, but in our experience, uh, the, the, this basic subroutine that we have for matching images works quite well. We, we haven't had any significant failure cases. The, the, and the, the reason we, we have that belief is because we're not just doing photometric matching. We, we supplement it with uh, ransack verification. So our matches are always cleaned up with ransack, and only then we use them uh, in, in subsequent processing. Yes? What fraction of matches come from the features versus the transitive closure? So I have a graph. So actually, the overwhelming majority come from the transitive closure. Because, uh, and you actually, so we did some experiments where after about four rounds, the efforts to gain ratio drops off very considerably. So the fourth round is where uh, the slope, the derivative, tanks. Uh, but the first, uh, so round three and round four uh, propose so round three has a small number of proposals compared, but round three, round four, and round five have the uh, have, have the largest growth in these graphs. And in fact, the study of uh, these graphs, I believe, is actually one of the more interesting questions. Uh, and, and I'll mention this later in the talk that this is a new kind of internet graph uh, that we have access to now. These image graphs, and they say something about uh, both visibility as well as people's interest in uh, in, in the physical world and in certain these monuments, and and it's very different from things like social networks or network graphs that are usually studied by people studying 
uh, large scale internet graphs or random graphs. And the fact that our algorithm works is entirely a function uh, of, of some statistical quirks of this graph. And I think it's worth studying further uh, if there is more that can be extracted or more ways in which it can be characterized. Because for example, there might be a power law that underlies uh, the growth of these graphs. And it, it's worth studying. So now that we have uh, matching results, uh, time to move on to the reconstruction. And sort of the generic reconstruction pipeline is that you, uh, you have a set of images that you have matched. And you start by choosing two images uh, or more to see the reconstruction. You find points uh, by triangulating the, the points that they see. Use the points to find the pose of a bunch of other images uh, that, that, that these uh, cameras are able to see. Add some more points by triangulation. And each of these steps is sort of local. So you realize that uh, there's usually some distortion. Uh, so you then spend some time doing some nonlinear refinement, uh, which is basically a very large uh, nonlinear least squares problem that you solve, where you adjust both the 3D positions of the points and the camera parameters uh, so that they most agree with the image, uh, the observation that you have inside the image. And then you repeat this step uh, as long as you can add more images uh, and, and points to the uh, reconstruction. And this works. Uh, quite well. Uh, this is sort of, yes? So imagine LS images using similarity. Yes. Um, but how do you account for the parallax? I mean, it's, do you use epipolar geometry, a point algorithm, to actually do the matching? I'm, I'm kind of curious because. Oh, so, uh, maybe I wasn't clear. So, so there are, uh, there are, in every round of matching, there are two phases. There is a proposal phase where we would either use the whole image similarity or the query expansion to propose whether we think two images should match or not. And then we'll go ahead and f do detailed feature matches between them. So we'll first match SIFT features using uh, uh, nearest neighbor. And then we'll go ahead and uh, clean those matches up by uh, using uh, either an essential matrix or a fundamental matrix uh, estimate. And then we'll st uh, seed the reconstruction with a pair of calibrated images. So we start with a five-point uh, estimate uh, for the relative pose, triangulate the points that they see, and then iteratively uh, increase the reconstruction. So this works quite well. Uh, this has procedures. This procedure or procedures like this are the foundation of uh, a lot of successful academic as well as commercial reconstruction systems. But it's also very slow. Uh, and there are a number of reasons uh, for why this is slow. Uh, but the primary reason uh, is that you have a lot of images. Uh, and as the number of images increases, you have to solve larger and larger optimization problems. But it, it's sort of, uh, again, go, going back to the kind of data sets that we're dealing with, uh, if you look at this match graph for the Stonehenge where each vertex is an image and, again, the edges are uh, if there are shared 3D points between them, you notice that it's a very uh, non-uniform uh, sampling of images. The top right contains all of these images probably from the front of the Stonehenge or where you approach the Stonehenge versus sort of the back of it. And just because there are, so ma just because there are that many images on that side of the Stonehenge doesn't mean uh, those images are actually contributing all that much information to the 3D reconstruction. So, and but if you look at the optimization algorithm or the bundle adjustment algorithm, it'll devote basically the same amount of effort to all of these images. So that begs the question, can we do something where uh, we sort of reduce this, this graph down to a subset which contains the essential, 3D inf uh, essential information required to build sort of a skeleton of the reconstruction uh, and then sort of add these images back later on? Of course, if you... Uh, remove images, they're obviously adding some information. You want to remove those images which are not adding too much, uh, which are not adding a substantial amount of information. So Noah, Steve, and Rick did some work uh, two years ago called Skeletal Sets. And there, the entire purpose is to sparsify this graph, sort of identify this backbone skeleton, which uh, at the cost of a little bit of uh, increase in the uncertainty or sort of the flexibility of this graph, 
uh, or inaccuracy in the 3D, resulting 3D re reconstruction gives you a substantial decrease in the computational complexity because you have sort of pared away all of these redundant images. Uh, and this is now part of our pipeline. So our large scale reconstruction pipeline is uh, you identify the skeletal set and you actually use the same iterative reconstruction procedure that I talked about earlier uh, to reconstruct this skeletal set. And then we just, uh, we have enough 3D points in the uh, reconstruction that for each image that we have removed from the skeletal set, we can just add it back by looking at what points are visible to that image. And then we do one uh, large step of nonlinear refinement where we try and inco uh, incorporate the information from all the images and all the 3D points at the same time to find the most accurate reconstruction. Okay, so I've mentioned the word bundle adjustment and nonlinear refinement earlier. Uh, this is, in some sense, w once you are in the reconstruction uh, stage, the most expensive part uh, of our reconstruction pipeline because you have to solve a nonlinear minimization problem one over again. It's a large, sparse, nonlinear least squares problem, and to give you an idea of its structure, it is, uh, it's about, so if M is sort of the number of points which you identify in, in images corresponding to the actual 3D world, uh, P is the number of cameras, and N is the number of 3D, uh, sorry, P is the number of 3D points, and N is the number of images that you're working with, then it's 2M by 3P plus NN. So where N, 9 is the number of camera parameters, 3 is the dimensionality of a 3D point, and for every observation, you get uh, two equations. And one of the things to note about it is that M is usually an order of magnitude or more larger than the number of points, uh, which, is more, uh, which is more than the number of images. To give you an idea, uh, in the video that I showed you earlier, we had N equal to about 14,000, which is the number of images, uh, P equal to 4.4 million, which is the number of points, and uh, M equal to 26 million, which is the number of observations. So most of the compute effort in this is actually spent uh, building and solving a sparse uh, positive definite, not semi-definite linear system, which is 9n by 9n. So there's a nice short complement trick that can be used there. And when we started working on this project, the state of the art bundle adjustment or nonlinear solver for this uh, is this piece of software called SBA from Greece. And it's neither fast enough or nor was scalable enough for our needs. Uh, it was, uh, it, it, it had a memory as well as time bottleneck. So uh, we wrote our own. And our bundle adjuster is called Bang. Uh, for Star Trek fans out there, it's bundle adjuster, uh, adjustment, the next generation. Uh, sorry to let my inner Star Trek nerd out. Uh, it's designed to well, it exploit all available sparsity. Uh, it implements uh, three, different the three different kinds of solvers, direct, sparse direct, and preconditioned CG. Uh, it has better step control than SBA, so it takes fewer iterations than SBA to converge. Uh, and in our tests, it's uh, 10 times or more faster than uh, SBA. And depending on sparsity, it can be uh, even faster still. The largest problem that you've solved using it is the San Marco example that I showed you earlier. Uh, it, it requires us to solve linear systems involving 14 million variables and 50, 53 to 54 million equations. And uh, we actually now have a distributed memory implementation of this bundle adjustment in the works. It's actually already up and working. What, what is the step control you use? So SBA, for some, exam, for, for some reason, actually doesn't use the true levenberg markard step. Uh, it uses the Levenberg step, uh, which was just scaled identity. The, right thing to do is to actually use a scale diagonal, which actually constructs a trust region, which is more elliptical and more shaped like the information that you have from the Jacobian. So this is really a collection of solvers? So uh, the levenberg markard algorithm uh, is a nonlinear least squares thing, but in the inner loop, you have to use, you have a solid linear system. And depending on the size of that linear system and sparsity, you may want to use one of these three. SBA only comes with a dense solver inside it. Uh, the largest example that we showed, we used preconditioned CG for. It's just block diagonal preconditioned CG, and that works quite well. The system architecture itself, uh, uh, for the matching system, it's a two-layer system that we uh, wrote on our own. Uh, it's a, the bottom layer is an application-agnostic Python-based uh, uh, distributed computing engine. It's really a very small amount of code. Uh, it's aimed at uh, doing data-intensive applications where uh, there is no way you're going to have this data in core. 
So it has very extensive support for local caching of data on disk uh, for on the on the cluster nodes, and it has some nice sophisticated operators for moving the data around based on on your application requirements. The core of this uh, is actually uh, OS dependent. It only depends on having a POSIX layer around. So I wrote this at UW on a Linux box, uh, and I ran it here at uh, Microsoft Research on uh, the uh, high performance computing uh, system uh, with Sigwin installed on it. The matching system in particular is written as an application uh, layer on top of the system, which is a combination of Python and C++ code. The, the hardware that we use is the Microsoft Research Cluster, which is a dual quad core Xeon with 16 gigs of RAM each with two terabytes of local disk. And we use a fair amount of this local disk uh, in our experiments. Uh, we were running this in a combination of Windows Server 2008 and Sigwin 1.5. I won't necessarily recommend this combination to everyone. Uh, Sigwin wasn't designed for doing high performance computing, but we sort of used it. Uh, the next generation of the system will not use Sigwin. I don't recommend it at all. Uh, and for various size experiments, we used anywhere between 350 cores to 500 cores. OK, so time to show some results. Uh, let's start with some basic statistics. Uh, I, sh I talked about the uh, matching statistics earlier. So, but another interesting number is sort of what is the largest component that you are, we are able to extract uh, from this because that's, that'll correspond to the largest reconstruction that we're able to do. Uh, for Dubrovnik, it was about 4,600 images. Uh, for uh, Rome, turns out, even though the data set is actually larger, the largest component uh, was the Colosseum corresponding to about 2,000 images. And for Venice, the San Marco Square came out as a nice 14,000 image. Uh, component, and so, which is why the reconstruction time for Dubrovnik is actually larger uh, than it is for Rome, because we were able to process these components uh, uh, quite quickly compared to uh, Dubrovnik. The Venice reconstruction took a couple of days uh, because the it actually was done with a couple of weeks in between because we had to rewrite part of our bundle gesture because we ran out of RAM. Uh, so. Onwards to some visual results. So this is, these are results from the Rome uh, data set. And the thing to remember here is that starting out, we didn't know what was in the data set. After you do the matching, you go back and look at some of the more interesting larger clusters and see, oh, this is the Colosseum. So this is the Colosseum, which is the largest component corresponding to about uh, 2,000 images. And I should mention that in all of these reconstructions, you'll see a bunch of points uh, and some cameras floating around. This is sort of the raw output of our system. We could have cleaned it up and shown you a much cleaner, thinner point cloud. But these are basically points which are sort of ill-conditioned, and they're very easy to remove. I, I talked about how these image collections enable us to do interiors, uh, which are not possible with other data sources. So this is the inside of St. Peter's Cathedral. And this has about 1,300, 1,400 images. From the Venice data set, we got two large components. Uh, this is the canal, and this has about 3,000 images in it. And as you can see, the uh, people take pictures from all available angles on the Rialto Bridge and from the boats. Gondola. Yes, the, the, the ones at the bottom are the gondolas. The ones on top are from the bridge. Uh, and finally. Uh, and here's the San Marco example one more time. And finally, this is sorry. Yes. Oh, you MLS to try to generate like just a mesh, just a. So uh, we haven't tr uh, tried on this. Uh, I'll show you an example in a second where uh, we had uh, Yasu run some multi-view stereo code. So we actually went ahead and did full stereo on it, and that results in some nice, nice models. Uh, this point cloud, actually around the domes and so on, I think we, we might actually be able to do uh, nice dense reconstructions there. But that's a good point. But we haven't run it uh, on, on these point clouds yet. And this is, uh, I think, all of us favorite example. This is the city of Dubrovnik. And even though this was the smallest data set that we started out with, uh, it actually resulted in the most interesting reconstruction because we had enough views to actually capture the entire old city. 
So this is 4,600 images, starting from 60,000 images. So uh, hopefully, over time, we can sort of grow this model. And another thing to notice is that we are actually able to reconstruct the hill uh, behind it, and there's actually an island in this sea in front of the city. We actually get part of that island, too. Uh, yes, there are, uh, there are loops here. I mean, the, the whole big thing, is that a loop? Whole... Yes, I believe it is. Uh, there is. There is a loop, uh, I think, on the... Uh, right over there, there is a loop over there. So where does us where does this place us? So here is a little bit of historical context. So our system does quarter of a million uh, process of quarter million photographs in 27 hours and 500 cores. It's still about 10 to 50 times from where we would like to be. Uh, but to put it in context, the sort of the first paper to look at unstructured collections of photographs for 3D reconstruction was Shafletsky and Zisserman's paper on how do I organize my holiday photographs in 2002. And the largest set that they looked at was 45 images. Noah, when he started working on photo tourism, the largest set he looked at was 2,600 images. And with the skeletal, set work, skeletal sets work, he was able to go up to 8,000 images. And the bottleneck here was basically the fact that everyone was using pairwise matching here. And our system, uh, by not using pairwise matching is able to go up to a quarter of a million images. Yes? So, I mean, the Oxford and Prague guys can do a million images as well, I think, right? But uh, th theirs is more of a query model. So th they retrofitted their query model for all pairs. So uh, there, I think it's worth, uh, uh, worth actually doing a time, time comparison. The, I mean, they started with a object recognition model and then did a structural motion. Uh, matching experiment, but you're right. The, there should be a number somewhere here that that points to them. Uh, on the side of reconstruction, our reconstruction system is still serial, uh, and that's sort of the next stage uh, of our project where we're looking at actually paralyzing uh, the system. The incremental SFM for even the thinned out skeletal set uh, can take quite a while, uh, and and I'll talk more about it in a second. And bundle adjustment, even with all the optimization that we have, is still both a memory and time bottleneck. And we're sort of 10 to 100 times away from where we would like to be. Uh, again, in terms of the graph, the thing to note here is that the, the, uh, the, bundle, the, the size of the reconstruction that we can process uh, is limited by two different things here. One, by what is the quality of matching results that you can get. So the size of the data set that you can match. So uh, the skull sets work, even though NOAA starts with 8,000 images, the largest connected component was about 3,900 images. And at that point, there is, uh, using SBA, you can't nonlinearly refine that anymore because you're using about 10 gigs of RAM just to store uh, the short complement. Yes? Or the 13,000 here is, is the largest pieces that come out in these videos. 13,000 images, uh, the 13,800 is the San Marco example. It is the largest piece that comes out. And. Uh, like many cores, how are you splitting this problem across the So this is running on a, a single multi-core machine. One, one reconstruction problem runs, runs on a single multi-core machine. This is not a distributed mem So the, re the pure reconstruction part right now is we just detect, we get connected components, and just throw each connected component onto a single core. Yes. So the matching is actually distributed memory. The reconstruction is not. And that's what we're working on right now. Typical iteration time on this 13,000. So, uh, good question. The typical iteration time uh, for the 13,000 was the setup for the bundle adjustment, I think about took 25, 30 minutes. Uh, setup meaning uh, we uh, build uh, sort of the sparsity pattern to figure out uh, what we're going to do and so on. So that's a one-time cost. And then the sure complement, uh, the PCG solver uh, converges in a couple of iterations, so it only takes a couple of minutes. The sure complement construction is actually where all the time 
goes. And I believe uh, that we spend five, anywhere from 45 to 55 minutes doing the just a short complement construction. And that's truly the dominant cost there. So uh, we run, uh, uh, sorry, iterations of the outer loop or the PCG? I guess the 45 minutes to construct the, the matrix. Yes. Each iteration. Right? Yes. So how many iterations? So uh, we do anywhere from, we run a minimum of 10 iterations, but then there's a conversion threshold. Yes. For the matching part, what was the strategy to distribute the computation in a distributed memory system? So we start out by uh, throwing images in it uh, on demand to, to machines for uh, verification and featureization. Then uh, each machine encodes, uh, does this uh, vector quantization for each image, for the images that it has. Uh, the, these vector quantized vectors uh, for each image are packaged up into a single, ma single sparse matrix. And then we do uh, an all pairs communication between the nodes because every, the, the, these vectors need to be com uh, compared to all other images to get the initial scores. Uh, once we have that, we have an initial graph of pairwise. So for each image, we choose, choose the top k uh, matching images to be verified further. So at this stage, we have uh, a putative graph uh, of, uh, with graph edges that we think correspond to true matches between images. So then there's a master node that will dole these uh, edges out, sort of uh, jobs of pairwise comparisons in chunks of uh, 100 to 500 uh, comparisons at a time. And that is, uh, so that's actually sort of the interesting part of our paper that I haven't talked about, which was we started out by thinking, oh, we have a graph here. We should cut it up in some sort of optimal fashion and distribute it uh, to the nodes. And for our small scale experiments, that worked quite well. The problem was that as the size of the experiment grew, and especially with these query expansion rounds, the number of edges was huge the cost of just doing the graph partitioning started dominating. And the graph partitioning tool that we were using, we were using Metis, uh, uh, and we were using the, the single uh, node version of it. We weren't using ParMetis. The cost of that dominated everything else. Uh, we were spending an hour, more than an hour, on the master node just partition, cutting up the graph. And it was not clear that the cost model that we were using or the graph representation that we were using was optimal uh, in any case. So then uh, we decided to take a much simpler route, which was we maintained uh, the state of each, we maintained what set of images each machine had, each, each of the slave nodes had on the master node. And every time a slave node would, would ask, uh, uh, I would like to do some more matches, we would uh, b basically do a greedy bin packing, taking into account the number of network transfers it would have to do to get the images that it doesn't have for doing the pairwise comparisons. And that works very, very well. And that automatically balances out the, the load uh, if some matches are taking more time than others. Because the graph partitioning approach was based on assuming that uh, all matches, all pairwise matches have basically unit cost. But that's actually not the case. Because we are doing photometric matching and then geometric verification and actually a little bit more. We actually, for some pairs of images, we actually do a full two view reconstruction because that's information that we use in our skeletal sets. So some Pairwise images can take uh, five to six seconds, and some will finish in one second. And that, at this scale, can aggregate into a lot of time. So it does dynamic, uh, that translates into uh, dynamic load balancing also, and cuts away that entire time uh, that we spent while all the sla slave nodes were idling. Does that answer your question? OK. So uh, the, the thing uh, to note here is that there were we were able to do our reconstructions both because uh, the size of the data sets that we were matching on were larger, so we could get larger connected components. Two, our bundle gesture can actually process uh, uh, reconstruction problems of this size. So what's the road ahead? Yes? How many images do you add before you bundle just? So that depends from round to round. Uh, there is a uh, criterion for uh, that you should be able to robustly add that image. Uh, it could very well be that there are points which are visible uh, for an image, but they're not well conditioned. So uh, it's not fixed from iteration to iteration. Also, another thing to note here is that right now, our, we don't use any robust norms. So our outlier removal strategy is bundle just, throw out uh, high, uh, high uh, residual outliers, and do bundle adjustment again. 
once we we are going to implement a uh, sort of a truncated quadratic or uh, Huber's robust norm uh, strategy here, and that should cut down on our uh, bundle adjustment time very significantly because right now, again, it, it's something that you don't notice for small data sets, but for large data sets, just the cost of removing outliers uh, dominates everything else. Why don't you bring them in later in the process? Because yeah, you can, yeah you, can, you can basically keep them sort of on the edge of the uh, uh, robust norm. Throw them out, you bundle them, throw out, and keep bundle them, just finding them back is that you can sort of... We don't, we, don't, uh, we don't add them back in. So, but uh, using a robust norm, that sort of uh, does away with that problem entirely. Uh, so uh, my pipe dream, I'm not sure if I should be calling it a pipe dream, is to actually have, yes? A few extra photographs. What, what is the runtime now to incorporate that? That's a good question. Uh, the system as it's structured right now uh, is a batch-oriented system. What we would like to build is actually a system where you can add photographs as they arrive, which is what I mean by an ever-growing digital model of the world. Uh, the, the thing is that the trade-offs are fundamentally different. Uh, in a batch-oriented system, you have a lot more information. Uh, we are, so I'm a computer vision guy. I barely know anything about systems. So my knowledge of how to load balance these large data sets on, on clusters is very poor, which, which is sort of one of the reasons why we took a batch-oriented approach, which is simpler. We have enough information, or we have a lot of information, maybe not enough information, to, uh, to know how to uh, distribute our work out. If, you have, if information is truly arriving in a, in a dynamic way, then uh, there is sort of no pruning that we can do. I, in this setup, for example, uh, after the first two rounds of matching, uh, we knew what images will never again participate. Uh, in the matching process. If you have a live incremental system where you can get a photograph from anywhere, you have to keep all the images around in the eventual possibility that there'll be a, that another image will arrive which will match with it. So it increases the system complexity uh, very significantly. And it's something that we have in our mind for something that we like to build. But right now, our system is not, uh, is not structured to be where we are adding photographs to it after, afterwards. Yes? Might only need to to save the the images corresponding to the skeletal set. That that's true. Once you have a substantial part of the reconstruction, and you only want to add images to the reconstruction itself. But imagine that you started with the images of the Colosseum, and that's all that you had. And then now you have some new sites within Rome that people started photographing. Say a new building came up, and the first time somebody uploaded an image, there are not enough images to match to it, and you threw it away then subsequent images will never match into it. So I have a question. So uh, the, your matching process is sort of designed to retain all the, the ground truth matches. And then you're sort of pairing away like redundant matches in the skeletal set, right? Yes. So I mean, could you imagine actually having like your first matching process? I mean, it's basically you collect all this, and then you pair it down. That Fantastic question. It's it's uh, th th there are there are a number of things going on here. You're very right that we spend all this effort building this really dense match graph, but at reconstruction time, the first thing we need to do is pare it down again. And this this is so because our reconstruction algorithm is sort of a separate phase from our matching algorithm. Uh, we are actively looking right now at ways in which we can bring this information back earlier. But there are a couple of difficulties with it. One is that the, it's not clear that the matches that you find in the earlier stages are actually the ones that will make it into the skeletal set. And here is why. We are using this whole image similarity to find matches between images. Now, whole image similarity will work best for identical images, which is sort of the worst case for doing 3D reconstruction. So we are in the process of do, uh, figuring out sort of what is the behavior of the edges that make it into the skeletal set. Which, what is the, so if you think of the uh, round in which they were added to the graph as their age, uh, is there a particular time in that timeline where they get added? Do they get added early or later on? If they get added later on, then we're in trouble. But I suspect they're actually added later on. And the reason for that is that you start with these clumps of very similar images, which are not geometrically uh, well conditioned. But then you do this transitive closure, which allows you to walk uh, on images which, with less overlap but they are geometrically better conditioned. But it's a 
uh, I think this is a fundamental source of inefficiency in our system, that we spend all this time doing matching and then spend more time paring it down. What would be ideal is that we sort of uh, either keep a partial reconstruction around or some information that uh, is not just saying, oh, I matches to J, J matches to K, let, let's uh, match I to K, but rather uh, some measure of uh, how useful would it be if I and K matched, uh, and useful would be in a geometrical sense. So uh, the step towards doing a fully textured model would be to actually take a sparse point cloud, uh, like the one produced by our system here, and actually run multi-view stereo on it. So, uh, sorry, Yasu's name is cut out from here. Yasutaka Furukawa is a uh, postdoc uh, at University of Washington. He was at UIUC before this, and he has one of the best performing uh, multi-view stereo systems in the world today. And uh, he ran his system on the Colosseum over here, and this is the dense patches that you're able to get uh, from the output of the system. And then he can go one step further and actually build uh, a dense uh, mesh, mesh model out of it. And we are uh, integrating his uh, work into our pipeline is also one of, the, one of the things that we're looking at. So this was actually done in a, in a data parallel manner. He partitioned the, the model into a couple of pieces using the SFM data and then ran multi-V state on each uh, component separately and then stitched everything together. Okay, so we have a decent image matching system uh, for our needs right now, but I don't think uh, we are quite there yet. Uh, the, as I mentioned earlier, that at some level we are still doing all pairs matching, which is we are comparing these similarity measures across the, uh, uh, similarity vectors for one image against all of them. The constant there is quite, slow, uh, quite small compared to doing detailed matching, but it's still quadratic. And there is no way this is going to scale. So one of the things that we, we are interested in is, are there any uh, sublinear for a single image or subquadratic for an entire image collection matching schemes? And the thing that we are we're looking at are distributed hashing schemes like min hash or uh, approximate nearest neighbor stuff that works in high dimensional vector spaces. Uh, when we started the project, we didn't, I mean, one of the questions that was raised was, can you do this in MapReduce uh, style systems? And we didn't quite understand the problem well enough to say yes or no. Now I believe that we can map it onto MapReduce, but it's still not clear whether it's worth doing. And there are two reasons for it. One, uh, we know a lot more about, uh, so th there are multiple stages of MapReduce to be done here, and we know a lot more about it uh, in terms of what these stages are doing, so we can cache our data much more intelligently across stages. Two, it will only address the matching question. Uh, reconstruction is not a sort of uh, map reducible problem. It's a very, it's a much more tightly coupled problem. So uh, we're still in two minds about exploring this. If we build a live system, then as I mentioned, the successful image queries, images, uh, queries that match certain images, they actually get added back to the database. In fact, even unsuccessful ones get added, added back to the database, but successful ones actually have a bigger effect because they either start a new reconstruction or uh, add to a reconstruction, and sometimes the reconstruction can grow beyond the capacity of a single machine. So dynamic load balancing, data migration, which are you know, fundamental issues in distributed databases, uh, will, have a, will have much to say in, in building an image, uh, image matching system that uh, goes uh, two orders of magnitude larger than what we are looking at right now. Uh, and the other thing is that th there's sort of a duality between the data sets that we're working with and data sets that uh, Street View or Virtual Earth has, which is uh, they have the coverage, uh, but we have sort of higher sampling, but they have more uniform sampling. We have uh, very non-uniform sampling, which means that the reconstructions that we get are, are in these cl interesting clumps of the city. And what would be interesting is to combine both of these data sources to uh, either sort of place these reconstructions uh, in the context of these uh, bigger systems or to actually do a bigger reconstruction which is sort of multi-scale, where you have uh, a lower sampling, then you have a lower resolution model. When you have more people taking more data, then you have a higher resolution model. Yes? Pumping situation you have, it's, it's good for you because you're over constrained and somehow getting the 3D geometry can be solved. You have two separate pumps that are loosely tied together to a street view. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that you get very bad sort of global geometry because you don't really have enough? I, so uh, you can go about it two ways. You could imagine doing these reconstructions uh, independently and then stitching them together. 
and not have the geometry affect each other. But I've experimented with some Google Street View data. And even though it's, uh, its sampling rate is not very high compared to these data sets, you can actually get quite good reconstructions from them. Uh, I am not sure. I think if you're careful about how you handle outliers and, uh, and, and you're carefully about, careful about growing the reconstruction, I don't think it should be that big a problem. So on the reconstruction side, as I mentioned, the, the way our reconstruction algorithms work right now is basically we start with a pair of images, and then you try and add images to it uh, as fast as you can without distorting the reconstruction too much. And this is basically, even if you're able to do bundle adjustment fast, this is still controlled by the topology of the match graph. So for example, in this case, there are two large clumps on either sides, and they're connected by a thin uh, connecting set of images. And you can imagine that there are two, two tourist locations, and there's a street connecting them, and you know, very few people will take images there. So, which means that the rate at which you can grow these uh, is quite slow. And if you are solving a large optimization problem at each step, and we sort of use it as a hammer right now, the complexity adds up. What you would like to do instead is you know, start with two parallel reconstructions at each of these clumps, grow them, and then uh, join them, and then refine them together. But this, this has, uh, you can heuristically build systems like this, but there is very little sort of rigorous work out there. And I think there are some very interesting questions in graph theory. There are interesting questions in scheduling these things, because you know, one of these clumps might be much larger than the other. In which case, does it really matter that you would start these two reconstructions in parallel? Uh, in other cases, uh, one of them, since the other one is smaller, it finishes earlier. Can, uh, how do you sort of synchronize them uh, and not make the whole system uh, basically a master-slave system? Ideally, you would like sort of an asynchronous distributed system, which doesn't uh, uh, depend on a, a system clock, uh, which does a reality check every time. Uh, of course, there are some interesting problem partitioning issues here. In a sense, qualitatively, is it related to ideas like nested dissection, that if you can divide yes. the work up, you get a, a big benefit? Yes. So the, the only thing that makes it more complicated is that it's, it's not a purely combinatorial thing. There is more information on these edges. We ha uh, our, since uh, we can only locally refine our models, we're sort of restricted by, uh, or we're constrained by uh, adding information which is well-conditioned at each point. So we have to take that into account, which is sort of the thing that, ha that you have to worry about in skeletal sets also. It's not just looking at the connectivity structure. There's also the well-posedness of, uh, of the partitions uh, that you cut. You might be able to get an efficient uh, partitioning of the graph, but uh, that graph might not result in a good reconstruction. Another thing which, uh, uh, which is something that I've been thinking uh, for a while is that suppose you have uh, this much of a reconstruction where the dots are the images and the edges correspond to the connections between them. And then you add a bunch of these red images to that reconstruction. The way we are doing things right now is then we go ahead and solve an optimization problem over all these images and the points that they see. But the thing is that the, the world is opaque. The amount of information that a single photograph or even a substantial collection of photographs that will add to an already existing model only corresponds to this thin slice of the world that they're able to see. The rest of it. Yes, there is connectivity between them, but there isn't too much going on there. In fact, if you actually look at the optimization results, the part that'll cor that corresponds to the vertices and edges in blue, that would not change a whole lot. I mean, it can in certain cases, if things like loop closure and so on, but if this was actually the topology of the graph, it, you don't expect it to change much. Right now, we go ahead and solve optimization problem over all these variables. But what is really needed, and I think there's an exciting opportunity for doing uh, large-scale optimization here, is a optimization algorithm that looks at the structure of this graph and uh, only pays attention to, for example, the black region and the red region. And this becomes even more important that where you can imagine the, uh, cases where the model is large enough, just uh, right now we are lucky we fit, fit our models in core. But if your model is large enough that part of the model is actually out of core, you have to know what vertices to touch before you can even decide to pull that model back into core. You can't just keep on going to the disk and uh, looking at uh, various images and vertices. So, uh, and I think th this will substantially speed, uh, an understanding like this of the reconstruction process will substantially speed up uh, our reconstruction algorithms. And uh, th this is going back to uh, sort of the question that uh, Hughes raised, that the, these image graphs that we have are, are a new class of internet graphs that we have available uh, to us. Uh, it's not something that 
theoreticians have traditionally studied, but I think they have some very interesting uh, theoretical properties. It would be nice to have some sort of theoretical characterization, whether there's a power law, how do these graphs grow. If you know how these graphs grow, then you have an idea of where you expect your reconstructions to grow. Can you uh, say that uh, this, these are the sites on which uh, more photographs are expected? Uh, how does the, these graphs are a function, as I said, of the, of the, of the actual 3D structure, the visibility of, uh, or, and the accessibility of the, uh, the, of, of the structure that is being imaged. For example, in the Stonehenge, you could kind of see that there was a circular structure in between. But that's not always the case, because uh, if you can walk into the structure, you might take photographs from inside, and then uh, they will be connected to the photographs from the outside in some cases, and the graph structure may or may not reflect that. So it is, it is an interesting combinatorial question that can you look at these graphs and say something about the 3D structure uh, that, they, that is being imaged by just looking at the combinatorial structure of the graph. So, uh, and that, that is without doing any sort of, or say a minimal amount of 3D estimation along these edges. And finally, uh, there is uh, there's a very interesting question that, you know, you produce all this data, what do you do with it? Uh, Systems like Photosynth and Phototourism, they were site-oriented systems. So they're moving one photograph to the other uh, or moving the entire model around by uh, holding your cursor down and rotating your mouse works. But something like that, uh, even if you could fit the model in memory, will not quite work on your desktop. Two, you, we want to build systems th that don't fit in your memory. So th there, is, there are questions of streaming. There are questions of uh, how do you move uh, Moving from one photograph to the other will never will, will, might make you move around in a single room or in a building, but can it take you from one side, one part of the city to the other one? So, uh, and if you haven't visited that city, you don't know what's there in that city. How do you enable discovery uh, in in, the, in such uh, environments? So, those are sort of the uh, research directions that I have in mind for for my work in the next couple of years. Uh, I'm not sure I'll get an opportunity to work on all of them, but my hope is that I'll at least work on. Uh, uh, a substantial number of them. Uh, the work that I've talked about here, uh, it's mostly contained in these four papers. Uh, I actually retyped uh, the name of my own paper wrong because I keep going between building and rebuilding. But the paper is actually called Building Rome in a Day. Uh, this is our new paper at ICCV this year. Uh, the multi-view stereo stuff uh, was described in Yasu's paper from CVPR 07. And the scuttle sets and photo-tourism papers are, of course, CVPR and SIGGRAPH 06. Uh, my collaborators on this are Noah Snavely, formerly of UW, now at Cornell. Uh, uh, Yasu, who's a postdoc, as I mentioned at UW. Ian Simon, who's a graduate student. Steve and Rick. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions. Yes? Well, I love this kind of stuff, but if I come to look at uh, the whole matching and reconstruction uh, steps from a, a devil's advocate standpoint, my feeling is the matching stuff we, we can take very, very far, right, into tens of millions of images and still sort of ingest images to quite, quite good rates. For the reconstruction, uh, we can take them up to, uh, to tens of thousands of images. My question is, do we really need to go bigger or can we do those sizes of pieces and simply geo-register them? Or feel that there are scenarios where we don't have enough to geo register all images? That's, that, that's a good question. Uh, mm -hmm. The system, I think, that also brings in a reliability to it that these pieces don't interact, etc. So, I think the, the, the scientist in me wants to believe uh, that, uh, yes, it is worth doing these large optimizations. Having said that, I do think that uh, with more and more uh, GPS information uh, and data like virtual Earth available to you, you can probably get away by building models which are a couple of thousand images uh, and stitching them together. But I think we should keep ourselves open to the possibility that uh, there are environments w uh, which will not be surveyed by, uh, by, lar by companies doing this kind of mapping. Uh, there are many, many cities. There are uh, many towns small towns uh, where uh, you, want, uh, you want to build this uh, and have things like loop closure work correctly. And in those cases, uh, I don't expect uh, uh, the, the, the stitching to quite work. I imagine that uh, 
some of our uh, reconstruction job will become easier as cameras have more GPS information or orientation information in them. But I don't think that should quite stop us from figuring out how far we can go. So yes, the engineering answer is, I'm sure we can go quite far. The science answer is, I want to go as far as I can. Yes? To the big two clusters, do you have a sense, is the, the network bandwidth the bottleneck in your algorithms, or is it the CPU utilization? Uh, so the, the different parts of the algorithm uh, are the vary in these CPU and uh, bandwidth issues. So the feature extraction is completely CPU bound. Uh, I mean, the transferring the images uh, doesn't take, take that long. Uh, the, okay, so it depends what environment you're using, first of all. The, the experiences that I had at the MSR cluster are really not valid to give, give you a true answer there. And the reason for that is that the sigmoid layer that we were using uh, has a very significant penalty uh, on accessing disk. It was not efficient at all. There's almost a 2, 2.5x hit to accessing disk. And that skews everything that you're looking at, both in terms of file transfers remotely, as well as reading, writing data to the disk. And uh, that, that made things quite bad. In my experience from uh, uh, on, on the Linux cluster where there was no sigmoid layer, we were actually talking uh, sort of the OS directly, uh, the file transfer costs dominate, uh, but uh, we, are, we have a fairly good uh, CPU utilization. So I would argue that for the most part, this is, uh, we are CPU bound. But uh, those experiments were smaller than the ones that I ran at MSR. Uh, it could very well be that I'm missing a, a scaling behavior somewhere. And uh, so I'll have a better answer for you in a couple of months' time when I have a better implementation running. Right now, my answers are approximate. Yes? One measure is how many copies do you keep of each image, right? Uh, not quite, because that actually depends on sort of what the structure of the match graph is. Uh, the, if, if the same image actually matches a lot of different images which are distributed across uh, the cluster, it, that image might get replicated. But the average would still be low if there's one image copy. No, I, I don't think so. I, the copying also depends on what the initial image distribution is. So for example, one of the things that we were lucky with is that we sorted the image by the uh, name of the individual. We named them as name of the, uh, the ID of the Flickr ID of the person uh, who uploaded the image, followed by whatever unique identifier Flickr associates with it. And that meant that for the most part, the images for a, from a single person typically ended up at a single node. And it turns out that images from a single person match quite well to each other. Uh, so if you replace it by sort of a random scattering, our network transfers and copies will go up. So it is truly a function of uh, sort of what the structure of the match graph is and what your initial data distribution is. Uh, the, the characteristic of the the actual parallel computing system are hard to gauge from that one number. And we're using any meta tags because images come with tags that might tell you something about location. So the only tag that we are using right now is the fact that the name of the city occurs in tags. So at that level, we are sort of pruning out the data. But you can very well imagine that uh, you're using uh, other information uh, about the particular site that they are at to do an initial clustering or partitioning. Even a very coarse clustering, I imagine, would, gi would give you some substantial wins there. Uh, Let's start over there. Uh, uh, start in the front. It seems like, uh, like, like the timestamp might help you with that, too, like the things taken during the day and things taken during the night. So uh, the, the unique ID that uh, Flickr assigns uh, actually has uh, is serial. So it, it grows. So we, uh, we have that advantage. But yes, uh, in fact, now that you mentioned day and Oh, okay. So that's uh, if you actually browse our results, it turns out that there are a couple of structures where we have two different reconstructions. One is the daytime reconstruction, and one is the nighttime reconstruction, because the nighttime images look sufficiently different from the daytime images uh, that we weren't able to match them. But you're right. So uh, if we are able to combine, if we if we know a priori what time the images were taken, we might be able to do more image processing or a different transform on the image to do the feature matching better. 
Yes. Uh, I was going to ask about the, the image database. Like, you could, in theory, just store the entire a million images on each node right? because it's not that big, I guess. Uh, it gets pretty big. Uh, let's, so let me give you a number. So we're talking about half a terabyte of images, uh, but then they get featureized. So yeah, are you saying that we should run SIFT on each image on, on every node? Between but we are we're not transferring images. We're actually oh, transferring SIFT, uh, the SIFT descriptors uh, across the images. We're not transferring. When I say we are transferring image, I actually mean okay. their representation useful for us. I just answered my question. Oh, okay. Sorry, uh, I should have mentioned that what we are transferring are actually uh, feature extract features, not not images themselves. And sometimes the features are actually larger than the images, uh, because the way SIFT works. Uh, I mean, we could restrict the number of features that it extracts, but we just let it run. And uh, it can extract enough number of features that the way it stores them, uh, it's actually larger than the JPEG image that you have. Okay, well, I want to thank our speaker. Thank you. Thank you.